This isn't a ghost story, but something which happened a long time ago when I was at university. My friend, A, was a regular pitcher in the university's baseball team. He was a well-built guy and he was tall as well. We had a test coming up and he was in the library cramming. I was also there and I saw everything unfold. I had the perfect view. The library was nice and quiet and before I knew it, it was already dark out. There was still plenty of time before the library closed though. You know those nights in late September where the night draws in quicker and it's rainy out? It was one of those. I saw A down there. He was putting his things in his rucksack and getting ready to leave. It was really raining heavily out there. I knew that it would be raining because I checked the weather forecast. A probably didn't check the weather forecast as he didn't bring an umbrella. There were a few left by the entrance of the library. I guess he thought he could just take one since no one was using it or perhaps someone forgot it there. He was that kind of guy, always taking what wasn't his. He would often ask to borrow things, never having the presence of mind to think ahead. He searched through the umbrellas, ignored the cheap-looking vinyl ones, and went for the biggest one he could find. He said later that he noticed something sticky on the handle. He thought it might have been a prank or something. I was stood up because I thought he was about to steal my umbrella, so I was keeping an eye on him. That's how I saw everything. I watched him open the large umbrella he selected, then a huge boom resounded around the library, emanating from the entrance followed by the sound of A screaming. Members of staff came rushing over to him. The whole library stunk of a smell not too dissimilar to fireworks. A was engulfed in smoke, and his right arm was alive with fire. The staff helped to quickly extinguish the flames, and A left in an ambulance. He suffered horrendous burns to his hand. The police and the fire department came to investigate what happened in the library. The umbrella was packed full of a gunpowder-like substance they said was found in fireworks. The outside of the handle was coated in some kind of flammable gel, the sort you might find in a camping store or something. The one-touch button part of the umbrella was equipped with a kind of ignition device, and when that button was pressed as the umbrella opened, it ignited the fire. What made things worse was the fact that A was wearing a coat made from a synthetic material. The heat of the fire melted his coat to his arm. The day that this happened was a particularly busy day in the library as a lot of students were preparing for various tests. There were so many people coming and going, it was impossible for the police to figure out who the criminal was. There were also no fingerprints on the umbrella and since the crime seemed to be targeted at no one in particular, it meant that identifying any suspect was impossible. Sadly, A didn't end up pursuing a career in baseball. He went in a different direction due to the nature of his injuries. What a shame. It really makes you think about taking things which aren't yours, doesn't it? This happened one night a few years back. I was a student at the time. I was working at a convenience store trying to save some cash for university. I was living with my parents. I walked a couple miles back home from my part-time job at the convenience store. I would usually get picked up, but my parents were out on a date. The fog was thick that night, and there was no one on the streets. It was a perfect autumn night. I was wrong, though. I noticed after about 10 minutes that someone was walking behind me. I didn't pay it much mind, but when this person was taking every turn I was taking on my route home, I grew concerned. I looked over my shoulder while crossing the road to see that the owner of the footsteps behind me was a man. I turned onto my street and up to my house, grateful to hear him turn off in a different direction. It was quite foggy that night. The street nights were lit early, and since I worked a long shift, I went over to the mailbox before going inside. I was expecting something. At that point in my life, 
I hadn't really had any paranormal experiences or been in the line of any inherent danger. That all changed that night though. While I was checking my mailbox, something appeared from the corner of my eye that made me turn to the right to face it. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. Then I quickly realized that there was a figure at the other end of the street. I was fairly certain it was the man. Not the guy from before, I prayed. It was strange because he was just standing there, completely still, and I guessed that he was staring straight at me. My fight or flight reflex kicked in, and I quickly made my way to my front door. The hairs on my neck were standing on end. I inherently knew that there was something off about this situation, and I needed to get out of it. I unlocked the door, turned to have a last look, and nearly fainted. The figure was now at the end of the driveway. I needed to get inside and get behind a locked door. Once inside, I looked through the window, and he was gone. I was trembling in fear. I couldn't see where this guy was, and I couldn't decide whether or not to turn the lights on, but I continued to periodically check the window. I almost jumped out of my skin when the neighbor's dog started barking loudly. I was really frightened. My blood froze in my veins as I heard footsteps, hearing the footsteps approaching my front door. I ran, covering my mouth to prevent myself from screaming, and I looked through the peephole. The outdoor sensor light wasn't on, but I could see the wall well enough due to the street lights, and it was light out due to the fog. Barely breathing, I stared through the peephole and gasped in fear when a dark shadow appeared. I was sure that it was the man with his hood pulled over his head, and he was inches from the door. Instinctively, I flipped the light switch and went back to looking through the peephole. He wasn't there. I raced around the house and turned every light on while trying to find my phone. I was in such a panic, I had no idea where I'd put my handbag. I was shaking in terror as I crept into the kitchen and grabbed a knife from the knife block. The dog had stopped barking, and for a moment, I thought that the man had gone to silence them. I was too frightened to look out of the window. Then, I heard my neighbor's voice yelling. I was saved. I won't repeat the language he used but he made sure that the creep was off of our property. He came over, and when I was certain that the man was gone, I opened the door. We spoke for a little while, and he calmed me down. I even asked him to check all the rooms in the house. I was a bit embarrassed, but I cannot tell you how shook up I was. It seemed like hours had passed before my parents got home. I explained it all to them, and they told me I needed to make a statement to the police in the morning. After one more check on all the windows, I went to bed. Early the next morning, at around 2 a.m., something woke me up, and I sat bolt upright, straining my ears. The silence was so deafening, but my beating heart almost hurt with the slowly building anxiety. I felt for sure that the man was back. I checked the windows. Nothing. I stayed up until dawn. I never saw him again, and I really don't want to either. The whole experience terrified me. I always make sure doors are locked, no matter where I go. Ever since then, I've been afraid of fog too. This is a scary experience I had with my brother. On the night that this took place, my brother and I decided to go watch a movie in the cinema. The only issue was that the movie wasn't screening in our town, and we would have to drive kind of far. We didn't really care though, as we were young. I think I was about 16, and my brother was 19. So when you're at that age, you feel like you have all the time in the world. It was just over an hour's drive, and the only showing was at night. We got there on time and watched our movie and then had some dinner in a fast food place. We hit the road at about 11 p.m. and started making our way home. It had been a great night. 
My brother was driving and I was in the passenger seat. We were using the satellite navigation system since we were driving along unfamiliar roads. Although it was kind of a long drive and late, we had plenty to talk about. We were talking about the movie and food for some reason. Just for some context, we were driving back to our hometown in Kagawa from Tokushima. This is in Shikoku. The navigation system leads us in a different direction to the way we came. It seemed to be taking us away from the highways. I felt like this was to avoid either an accident on the road or some late night reworks. It wasn't great though because we were on National Route 11 and that ran alongside the sea. It was incredibly well lit and the roads were wide. Now we were going through winding narrow mountain passes. We ended up getting a little lost. Since my brother and I didn't know these roads, we couldn't really figure out where to go. I mean the satnav wasn't exactly helping us, but as we were young, we felt as if the satnav knew better, so we made a choice to keep following its directions, and that turned out to be a very bad choice. We headed further into the darkness of the mountain and away from the bright lights of the highway. We would try to reassure one another that we were probably being sent to a shortcut and everything would be fine. We relied on the satnav's directions. The last of the streetlights disappeared. There was nothing but darkness ahead of us and all around. I got worried, so I said to my brother, This is a little odd, huh? The satnav says it's fine, my brother replied. He couldn't hide his look of concern from me. I could see it written on his face. Dark thickets of trees towered either side of the road as our car chugged up higher into the mountains. Because we were now on uneven roads, the car was making some strange noises, which began to panic me. It sounded like the engine was struggling. I swallowed my pride and said to my brother, Hey bro, I gotta be honest, I'm getting scared now. Why don't we make a U-turn and just get back on the highway? My brother didn't respond. He was just fixated on the road ahead. I felt my heart begin to canter now. I asked him the same question again. He didn't say a word. I watched as he tightened his grip on the steering wheel. Hey bro, come on, you're scaring me now. Just as I was about to ask him to make a U-turn for the third time, he drew in a deep breath and finally spoke. Don't look behind. Something strange is going on. I felt my spine turn to ice. I didn't even really understand what he meant. Why was he being so vague? I instinctively wanted to look behind me, but I did as he asked. I sat there in silent contemplation, unable to muster the courage to say another word. For a little while, I thought that my brother might be teasing me. We did like to prank one another, but neither of us had ever gone as far as this. This seemed way too serious. I looked over at him to see if he had a sly smirk on his face, but he looked like he was in the zone, incredibly focused and yet incredibly concerned. When I saw that look of determination on his face, I knew there was something behind us. I noticed that we were speeding up as well now. Then my brother floored it. I felt myself slam backwards in the passenger seat. It was terrifying. At any moment, another vehicle coming in the opposite direction could appear behind one of the bends in the mountain road. We were going way too fast. Whatever was behind us had forced my brother to drive incredibly recklessly. I went against my brother's orders, and I looked in the wing mirror to try and see what was behind us, but I couldn't see anything. Had my brother just gone completely mad? I was silent. I wanted to plead with him to slow down, but I didn't want to divert his attention from driving. Despite being on these dark, intricate roads, he drove even faster. I felt for sure that we were going to collide with something at any moment. So I kind of braced myself. I tensed up. Then, suddenly, we were turning. We skidded into a hard left, and at that moment, I shut my eyes and braced for impact. A second or two went by, and I slowly opened my eyes and looked over at my brother. His face had lost all of its color, and his knuckles were white. 
It was as if he was hanging onto that steering wheel for dear life. I couldn't make a sound. I just prayed that we would get back on some streets with lights and away from whatever had scared my brother into driving like this. I shut my eyes again, thinking back to that night now. Trying to remember how I felt really makes me feel for my brother. I mean, if I was feeling that scared, I bet he was feeling it more since he was the one driving. After a few moments, my brother said, It's okay now. He's not following me anymore. I think we're good now. I opened my eyes to see streetlights in the distance. It was as if my prayers had been answered. We turned onto the National Highway route and I saw the sea. I knew that when I saw that, we were going to be fine. I cannot tell you how relieved I was at that point. Once relief settled in, a new feeling emerged. Curiosity. I needed to know what caused my brother to drive like our lives depended on it. I needed to know what had been following us. Bro, what was behind us? Something really freaked you out, didn't it? I asked him. My brother drew in another deep breath like before and said something like this. Pretty much as soon as we made that turn off onto the mountain roads, I felt as if we were being tailed. I knew because at one point the rear sensor went off. I didn't see anything behind it first because of the dark, and that was when I realized that we were being tailed by a car without its headlights on. I thought that whoever was driving must know these mountain roads well if they were confident enough to drive with no lights. At first he was glad to see that other cars were using these roads because he thought that the sat-nav might be right. He said he felt uncomfortable that the car had its lights off. He wanted to pull over to let it pass as it was speeding up behind him now and then. However, the roads were way too narrow to allow him to pull off to the side to let the car behind pass. It was at that point he glanced in the rearview mirror to try to get a better look at the driver. He said the sight of the driver took his breath away. The driver had the interior light of his car on and my brother could see his face. He was smiling. He said it wasn't a happy smile, but a disgusted grin that came with furrowed brows. That was the moment that my brother said he knew we had to get away from that car and its driver. That was the moment he started driving faster. It made sense to me now why when I looked in the wing mirror, I couldn't see anything. When my brother made that screeching left turn, the car behind apparently carried on going straight. We weren't sure if the driver tried to turn around to follow us, but we don't think that he did because my brother didn't see him again that night. We managed to arrive home safely without further incident. That experience really had an effect on my brother. He became a lot more anxious and jumpy after that. He sought out some help though, and thankfully I don't think it has permanently scarred him or anything. My brother and I are fine these days, doing well, no injuries. That was one scary night though. I torture myself every now and then when I think about what that grinning driver's intentions were. I feel as if he was trying to shepherd us someplace since he appeared to know the mountains well enough to drive in the dark. He wasn't scared of showing us his face, and that is pretty unnerving. It makes me feel as if something more than a robbery might have been on the cards. Your guess is as good as mine. I once matched with someone on a dating app and it completely put me off ever using apps like that again. At first we got on quite well, well enough for us to have a date, but something about him and me just didn't feel like a great fit, unfortunately. The reason why I didn't think we would ever become an item was because he came across as a pretty weird dude. He was a little bit intense, you know, a bit stalky, full on. Unfortunately, he already had my information, so I would sometimes hear from him and keep in touch with him via an app called Line. I felt that if I blocked him, something bad might happen. He might fly off the handle. 
This guy had this intensity that was just haunting. I didn't want to provoke him. I know that sounds so dumb, but that is how I felt. Eventually, I stopped opening his messages. I just left them unread. After a while, he got the picture and stopped contacting me. I know it's not nice to give someone the cold shoulder like that, but he kind of left me no other choice. If I ever did reply to him, he would pounce on it and bombard me with messages at all hours of the day and night. He stopped messaging me and I thought that would be the end of things. I assumed that he had given up and moved on. However, one day during a particularly cold winter in my city, something bad happened. It was freezing as I walked home from work. I didn't think that I could feel any colder, but when someone jumped out in front of me from some darkened alley, my heart felt like it was turning to ice. It was him, the guy I went on a date with months ago. So there I was, confronted by the creep I had thought I had successfully avoided. I was really scared. He just stood there in my path and didn't say anything. He was glaring at me, and I was shocked into a silence. I didn't really know what to say at first, but after a couple of awkward seconds, I asked him what he was doing here, and he said something like, What's so bad about two lovers meeting? I mean, it's only natural I come round to see you, if I can't reach you by the phone, right? Shows I care. What he had said made no sense. It had been a good few months since we had spoken, and even longer since we had had our one and only date, it made no sense at all. I thought that he was obviously crazy, and then I thought about getting as far away from him as humanly possible. So fight or flight kicked in, and I just ran. All I wanted to do was go home and forget about the weird encounter with that guy, but I realized that if he had met me on my route home, then there was every chance that he might know where I lived. I realized that it would have been totally dumb to go straight home. So I stood there as it snowed, cowering in some disused building's archway, frantically thinking about what to do next. After the adrenaline subsided, the solution was obvious. I needed to go to the police, so I went to my local call man. Hi, Jay here. A call ban is a station for police officers built at key areas in the city, such as in front of train stations or in shopping districts. The word call ban literally means taking turns to keep watch because police officers are stationed there at all times. And these officers, they take turns, shifts, or kotai in Japanese, to keep watch, which is ban in Japanese, ban, 24 hours a day. They make walking home at night feel pretty safe, and I have been grateful of their help a couple of times in Japan. Anyway, back to the story. After I made my report to the officers, they told me that they would patrol my area, just to be on the safe side. I felt reassured, but not exactly safe. And if I'm completely honest, after that night I turned into a bit of a recluse for a while. I developed an acute fear of leaving the house. Three months or so went by and there was no sign of that one day wonder I matched with online. So I slowly but surely regained some confidence. I went outside by myself for the first time in a long while. I was relying on the help of my friends and family up until then. I planned on heading to the supermarket. I knew the route and I knew it was close. The Corban was nearby, and I felt it was a relatively safe route. In the word of a lie, I got about 20 paces up my street, and then I heard a voice call out to me from across the street. I was addressed by my name. It wasn't an oi or a cat call or anything like that. This person knew me. Here is roughly what the guy shouted at me. Hey, can I? I've been waiting for you. He crossed the road with a light jog and stood a couple of paces behind me with a completely straight poker face. Hey, you know you didn't need to call the cops on me, right? Don't you think that was a little mean, sweetheart? I was so scared that I couldn't make a sound. 
I knew I had to run, and I'm so happy that I chose that route I did to venture out for the first time, as I knew exactly how to get to the Corban. I ran there, and I reported what happened. I have to say, life so far has been pretty incident-free since that second reporting. But that was how it was before. I feel like I have been lulled back into a false sense of security. I feel like it might be the calm before the storm again. Winter is rolling around, and the nights are getting darker. When the snow begins to fall, I'm scared all those memories of being stalked will return to me again. This happened pretty recently, and because of it, I will be quitting my job at the end of the month. My current job is to deliver papers to homes in the mountains, basically in the middle of nowhere. It's tough, because I have to start at midnight in order to get all my deliveries done. It doesn't exactly pay well, but it's good to be working, especially when you're young. It's nice to have your own money, right? Anyway, like I said, I start at midnight, and I don't finish until the sun comes up, and sometimes in the darker months, the sun doesn't come up at all. Being out in the mountains alone at night can be pretty spooky, as I'm sure you can imagine. I want to share my recent scary experience with you. It happened this winter. I'd gotten used to the rhythm of deliveries by that point. It was around winter time that the newspaper company I worked for was trying to expand their business. This meant that there would be more work for me. I was excited, at first, to earn a bit more money, but over time, it became more and more time-consuming. Basically, a subscription would come in, and then it would be down to me to deliver it to the customer. So I'm basically riding my bike around with a map, because signal is a no-go in the mountains. I don't mean a push bike, I mean a really low-quality motorbike, low CCs. The people who buy these subscriptions have an amazing ability to be unfindable. It never felt as if it was straightforward. I had one of these subscription jobs on that winter's night. I knew the address, and I knew it wasn't going to be an easy night. There were a few roads through the forest areas, and even worse was the fact that some of the roads were very narrow. I could barely ride my bike along them. I set off and rode my bike right up to the point where the narrow road began. Since it was winter, I figured it would be safer if I just parked the bike up and delivered the subscription on foot. There was a footpath after all. There was a post box at the end of the customer's drive. It was a short distance from the house. I started down the sloped road towards the post box, and then I froze in my tracks. I heard the sound of a dog barking. No. Not just one dog, it sounded like there were at least two. I thought not much of it, and approached the post box with the subscription in hand. It was still pitch black out at this point, despite it being the early morning. As I approached, I noticed a light turn on at the front door. There was an old lady stood outside under the porch. Seeing her gave me a fright. I thought to myself, oh wow. Someone super eager for the morning paper. I figured since she was out, I could literally just put the subscription in her hand. So I approached her. I stopped when she started yelling at me. Stop right there. What do you think you're doing? I'm delivering the newspaper and your subscription. The boss made us wear a uniform, and we had to have this ID card around our neck, as some customers, especially ones like this who live in remote areas, can be skeptic of people they don't know. Stranger danger. I raised my ID badge as I assumed she could see me pretty well. You expect me to believe that? You think that's proof? She screamed at me. I could see the dogs, especially the whites of their teeth. They were bared at me while the animals snarled. The old woman then pulled out a pair of long gardening shears or scissors from behind her back and pointed them at me. I instinctively backed away. I just tried to remain as calm as possible. I wondered if she was suffering with some kind of disease, maybe something like dementia. If she came at me with those long scissors, I planned on pushing them away or trying to kick her in the abdomen. 
I practiced full contact karate. However, she was an old lady. I don't know if I could have done that to her. I hoped that it wouldn't come to that. I just said, well then, I will just leave this here and be on my way. With that, I turned to leave. I didn't get paid enough to deal with this rubbish. I upped my pace as the old lady was still shouting at me. She sounded as if she was getting riled up. The dogs were really barking at me now. I turned to look over my shoulder and I saw her let go of their leashes. She was walking towards me, slashing the scissors through the air. She wasn't making any sense. I couldn't make out a single word she was shouting. It was time to run. I raced up the hill as I heard the dogs chasing me. I couldn't believe she literally released the hounds on me. I ran up the hill as fast as I could. I needed to get back to my motorbike. I got back to the bike, kicked out the stand and hopped on. I started the engine and had a look behind me. I saw the tips of the dog's heads coming up the slope and pulled away without looking back. It was really scary. To be honest, I think myself incredibly lucky to get out of there without any injuries. Those dogs wanted to bite me, I could tell. The old woman looked as if she would have joined in too. I imagined her plunging those large gardening scissors into my gut. I shudder at that thought now. After I delivered all of my newspapers and subscriptions, I spoke with my boss and told him about my close call. He decided that he would make contact with the customer to see what was going on. I could already imagine that he was going to take the side of the customer. It was just the kind of guy he was. However, he found that the customer's phone number was no longer in use. He decided to go out there himself and speak to the customer in person. I told him to watch out for the dogs. He said he would let me know how it went when I came into work next. I spoke to him the next day, and he told me that he went out there to meet the customer, but he found nothing but an abandoned house. He then made contact with the subscription company to find out why someone would want to send a subscription to an empty house. It was at this point we learned that the subscription company had fudged the numbers to make our company take their business. They wanted it to look like they had more customers than they did. They had a quota to fill, so they gave out a couple of addresses of abandoned homes. Stupid. Who the hell is the woman with the dogs then? I have no idea. When I think back to how hate-filled her face was, it gives me the shivers. Hence my resignation from my newspaper job. I'm working until the end of the month, so I hope I don't get sent anywhere near the scissor woman's house. I only have a few more days of work left. When I went back to my hometown last year, something really weird happened. It started when the neighbor across the street warned me that there was a suspicious person in the area. Apparently someone was going around ringing people's doorbells at around 1am in the neighborhood. My neighbor said that they ignored the doorbell at first since they were in bed as it was so late. Everyone in their house was in bed asleep. The doorbell kept ringing so my neighbor's husband got out of bed to see what was going on. He took his phone with him so his wife could listen. He asked through the door in a quiet voice, Who is it? Is there some sort of emergency? Then a man's voice responded, Ah, I made a promise to Sarah. Can you let me in? There was no Sarah in the house or in my neighbor's family, and because it was a newly built house, there was no former resident called Sarah either. So he explained this to the stranger at the door and told him to get lost. But it's a promise. I... I remember it well, the stranger said. Well, I have a promise for you to remember. If you don't go away, I'm calling the cops, okay? The neighbor's husband called the cops anyway because the guy outside didn't show any signs of leaving. The police arrived quickly, but the man at the door was nowhere to be seen. So the neighbor warned us to be careful, just in case he came back. We spoke about it at dinner that night, and I remember my parents were making sure everything was locked when the sun went down. 
Later that night, my dad and I were in the living room watching TV. It was just after midnight. The doorbell rang. I really didn't expect it, and I could tell neither did my dad. There we were, two full-grown men, afraid of the doorbell. Before assuming that it was the weirdo who called at my neighbor's house, I actually went and checked. We didn't have any way to check outside, you know, like those ring doorbells, so I crept over to the curtain. I pulled the curtain back just enough to create a gap to look outside. Through the gap in the curtains, I saw a man wearing a hat and a big dark brown overcoat. He was wearing boots as well. His face was hidden by the turned up collar of his overcoat. I couldn't really see his face. I watched as he pushed the doorbell again. My dad whispered to me to not get caught looking at the guy, so I immediately shut the curtain. This guy was definitely suspicious, there was no doubt. I mean you wouldn't want him at your door, let me put it that way. We decided to call the police since the neighbors were already worried about the guy, but until the police arrived, we thought we would keep him busy since last time he bolted. For about three minutes straight, he rang our doorbell. He was so persistent. My dad had had enough of this, so he went out to the hallway and approached the door. He stood before the frosted glass and asked, who are you? I'm the guy who promised to meet Sarah. What's your name? Um, well, is this an emergency? I promised Sarah. I really want to come in. The guy talked in circles. Of course there was no Sarah in our house either. If you told him that though, he would just keep talking about his promise. It got you nowhere. He kept saying that he remembered his promise. While this was going on, I called the police discreetly. I wanted to see this guy get taken away, but he left before the police car arrived. We then heard the knocking at the door. Police, the officer said. We have a door in front of the actual front door to our house, you know, like a porch. I was amazed to hear the knocking from the officer on our actual front door, not on the porch. When the weird guy was at the door, I was certain that the porch door was shut and I didn't hear it open or close when he left. This door can only be locked from the inside. How the hell was that possible? I wondered. It creeped me out, but my dad didn't seem to care all that much. He calmly explained the situation to the officer. He gave a really accurate description of the guy too and informed the cop that this happened in the neighborhood last night. The officer said that he hadn't seen anyone suspicious in the area. This guy knew how to get away and fast. However, there were footprints in the snow. The cop said he would follow them and see if he could find anything. He promised that there would be an increase in patrols and asked us to report back to him instantly if the guy came back. He cautioned us, said to try and avoid going out alone late at night and to double and triple check the doors are locked. This cop wasn't a new guy. He was older than my dad and something about the situation had him spooked. I was getting very nervous. There was something very sinister about this guy looking for Sarah. My mother watched the whole thing. She was sat on the stairs. I turned to her and asked if she definitely locked the door outside the front door, that porch door I mentioned and she was adamant that she did. My dad could sense our nerves. He tried to laugh it off. Don't worry, guys. Sorry we couldn't get him. After we all confirmed and were happy that all the doors were locked, we went to bed. I couldn't sleep much, but I was relieved to see a police car patrolling the area at around 3 a.m. from my window. The next day, we heard that someone else in the neighborhood's doorbell rang. My dad was really angry at the police. He said they must not be doing their jobs right if they hadn't caught the guy yet. Four more days passed where others in the area reported the late night doorbell rings. Everyone said the same thing. A stranger came to their door asking for Sarah and asking to come in. He wasn't caught. The thing I find weirdest about it is this. Not one person was able to describe what his face looked like the stranger was the stuff of nightmares.
I spent New Year's with my family and left to go back to my home, worried for them. About a week later, I called my mom to check on her, and I got an update on the situation. The house across the street from us found a note in their mailbox that read, Sarah's not here, but I found her. Thank you very much. The letters were painted by a brush, like calligraphy. I'm wondering if we will get an apology letter too, or what it means if we don't get one. I'm sorry, it sounds like a mundane story, but imagine if it happened to you. A stranger whose face no one saw in the neighborhood, going around in the dead of night, talking nonsense, and trying to talk their way into your home. I don't like it. I don't like that he found Sarah, either. I got a job in the beginning of last year. It lasted for six months, and this experience was near the end. To start off with, I would walk home in the dark, right out the back door, because there was a stretch of asphalt, a small hill, and then a sidewalk path leading into my neighborhood nearby. Even though it was a five-minute walk and through a neighborhood, my mother got me some mace in case of emergency for when I was walking home. Out the back door, there was a small nook before a small road on the edge. You had to walk forward and to the right to get to the dumpster, and there was a tiny parking lot in the nook to the left. It was a closing shift for me and another worker. I had a good relationship with him, and we considered ourselves friends. As it got time to take out the trash and clean the place, my co-worker started on the dishes while I took out the trash. We had quite a few bags, so I had to take multiple trips. I go out the back door and see a car. I'm really bad at car names, and it was sort of farther away, so I don't know the car name, but I did see that it was lighter in color. The car's driving very close to the little hill at the end of the asphalt, and as I watch, the car stops and the headlights go off. I think to myself, well that's not great, better keep an eye out. I go back inside for the next load of trash, and when I come out, the car has gone from the edge of the road to the farthest parking stall to the left, much, much closer, but the lights are still off. This is the point when I knew this situation was not good, so as soon as I finish throwing the bags into the dumpster and have gotten close to the door, I announce loudly that I'm getting my mace. Spoiler alert. This was probably what saved me. I grab my mace from my purse inside and then go up to my coworker and ask him if he will take out the trash with me because there's a creepy car in the parking lot. So we open the back door, my mace in hand. The car is nowhere to be seen. I apologize and tell him what happened and he believes me and still helps me out with the trash. When we're done cleaning and ready to go home, he offers to drive me home, and I decline. I ask if he'll walk me to the sidewalk, stating that I have the mace for a reason and will use it if I have to. I get home just fine. After that, I never took out the trash without bringing my mace with me. I even remember warning another female co-worker that if she was taking out the trash, she could borrow my mace. I live in a pretty small town, and I have a pretty quiet life, in all honesty. I have an office job, and I work some pretty long hours, so I don't really go out all that much at night. On the night that this experience took place, I got a call from a friend of mine. To be honest, I almost didn't pick it up, but I'm really glad that I did. She had called to say that she needed a ride. I didn't mind, I didn't have any plans. She needed to be picked up from a big supermarket. I guess that she had bought a ton of things and she didn't want to take all of that on the crowded train home with her. I was happy to help, but it seemed a little late to be shopping. It was around 11pm when she called. I needed a couple of things too, so I headed into the store to meet her. 
The supermarket was almost empty at that time of night, but it is usually really busy during the day. We got our things, paid, and headed back to the parking lot. I think that it was about midnight at that point. A group of men came out of a nearby game center. It's like an arcade. I think these guys came out because the place was about to close. They headed to their cars while talking to each other and looking over at us. My friend said to me that she wasn't feeling well and we decided to get going. We pulled out of the parking lot and a couple of the other cars followed on behind us. That was normal though, it was closing time and the lights in the retail park were all going out. I noticed that my friend was quiet. I guess that was just because she said she didn't feel well. I looked over at her and she looked pale. She looked at me and said, I think I know the guy in the car behind us. I didn't think much of it when she said that. I thought that it was just some coincidence. I went to look in the mirrors to see if I knew him too. And then my friend suddenly said, don't look back. I realized why she was so uncomfortable now. And I tried to pull over to let the guy pass, but then my friend snapped at me. She said, don't stop the car, whatever you do. I did as she asked and continued. That's my ex-boyfriend. If you stop, I'm scared he'll come and try to open the door. Okay, this is serious, I thought. I made up my mind not to drive down highways. I wanted to avoid traffic lights, which would mean we would have to stop. When my car stops, the doors automatically unlock while the car is in drive. So I decided to take the back roads. And man, that was a bad idea. Thinking back on it now, I should have probably gone to a late night diner or convenience store. You know, somewhere bright with lots of people around. But I think that my friend would have freaked out if I even tried that. So I kept driving down these countryside lanes, the back roads, until my friend calmed down a little. The car behind was following every turn we made. The further we went from the city, the fewer cars were seen on the road with us. It got to a point where it was literally just us. The car behind was speeding up too, forcing me to go faster and faster. I asked my friend, why is this guy chasing us? And she said, I think I made him really angry. I don't want to stay at my place alone tonight. She then began to cry, and I didn't really get my answer. The situation we were in was getting more and more unnerving. I didn't know how it was going to end, and I didn't want to consider the possibilities. I kept driving. There wasn't much else I could do. But then something occurred to me. I had quite a small and light car, and the car behind was much bigger. What if I went down a narrow road? Maybe that would stop the guy from chasing us. He would be scared to damage his car. I decided to take that risk and turned down the next narrow road I found. I kept an eye on my navigation system to try and find a way back out of there. I didn't want to be stuck down some dead-end road. I needed to keep driving or at least get to someplace safe because I didn't want to send my friend home in the state she was in. I thought about trying the police, but I knew that the police wouldn't do anything about the guy. It seems like they only help after the fact, never before. My friend was sobbing next to me but she stopped to apologize for getting me into this mess. I mean, I should have sensed something was up. She hadn't ever called me for a ride from a supermarket before. She said she called me because she didn't have anyone else she could turn to. I told her that it was okay. I just wanted to know where I should be driving her. And she replied, Don't take me back to my house. If we did just lose him, that's where he'll be waiting for me. Can you take me to the train station? I said that I could but she could also stay at mine for the night. She vehemently refused. She said she had caused enough trouble. I realized something at that point. The stuff she had bought at the supermarket looked like she had been planning to run away. She even had some camping equipment. I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't fully understand the situation, but I knew one thing. The man who was chasing us was very dangerous if running away from her life in our town seemed to be her preferred option. She said that she would stay in a hotel that night. She would get off the train far away and lay low. She was going to hotel hop too. Make sure her location changed every now and then. I felt for her, I really did. She said that she felt like he was always watching her and he knew how to find her. 
That's just so scary to me. I didn't want to ask about her ex, but I was curious as to why she was so scared of him finding her. I said something like, he sounds like a real horrible guy. And she replied, it's not just him who'll be looking for me. It's his group of friends too. That was frightening. Something really bad was going on. I managed to follow the narrow back roads back to the city, and I got her to the station, like she asked. I was confident that he wasn't following us anymore. I felt for sure that he had given up. She got out at the station, and we found out that the next available train would come in at 6 a.m. I couldn't leave her there for that long in the state she was in. I asked her to come with me to a McDonald's. I thought that we could talk things over a little, and I was right. She told me a little more about the situation and that ex of hers. She told me that he didn't take being broken up with very well. He attacked her. He made threats against her friends and family and tried to use fear to coerce her into getting back with him. He was also convinced that she had been with his friends. He said all this after she found out he had been on a bunch of dating and hookup apps. One of her single friends showed her his profile and she confronted him. She said that his friends are all a bunch of stalkers like him too. I was shocked and finding it a little hard to follow her story. Personally, I think they could have been as bad as one another with the cheating by the sounds of things. She turned to me and said, I want you to forget about me, okay? I'm not going to have anything more to do with you. I mean, it's very sad to lose a friend, of course, but equally, I didn't want to get involved with these weird guys and be chased by random men at night. I was feeling conflicted. She began to cry again, and she kept saying, It's really my fault this time. After dropping her off at the train station and helping her onto the platform with her bags, she turned to me and gave me 10,000 yen and said, Thank you. I'll always be grateful for tonight. And that was the last time I ever saw her. I had tears in my eyes as I drove home from the station that night, but they felt like they instantly dried up when I noticed a certain car in the lane next to mine. I couldn't believe it. The guy who had followed me earlier was still out here looking for us. I got goosebumps, but I tried not to make it obvious that I had noticed him. By some miracle, he didn't appear to notice me or my car, and after four or five pretty frightening minutes, he turned off in a different direction to me. As soon as I got home, I completely crashed out. It was the first time in a long time that I had been awake that late. Despite everything that happened that night, I'm glad that I answered her call. I mean, what might have happened to her? If I didn't, it's something I don't want to ask myself. I never heard from her again. Fast forward to three months later, and I got a call from my friend's number. I was really interested to see how she was doing, so I answered it straight away. I quickly found out that it wasn't my friend on the other end of the phone. It sounded like someone wasn't even using a phone. By that, I mean it was kind of computer-like. The voice at the other end of the line asked the following question. Hi, have you heard from my... The man calling from her number seemed to be polite and friendly. But I knew he was likely one of the guys who was chasing her and me that night. I was a little scared to say anything at first, but then I managed to say, Actually, I haven't heard from her in a very long time, so sorry I can't help you. Ah, uh, is that so? Well, then I'm sorry to have bothered you then. And the call ended. I was so scared, even though it wasn't happening to me. I had a way to contact her through a separate messaging app, but I didn't dare use it, just in case. One of those guys, or her ex, had a way of tracking her messages. I hoped she managed to start a new life, and although that call was scary, it told me that they hadn't managed to track her down. If you are out there, stay safe, my friend. I hope you enjoyed that, guys. I want to give a special mention to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories from Japanese. Check out his channel for more stories you haven't heard before. I'll put the link to his channel in the description. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. 
you can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Rebecca James, Mason Hayes, Chelsea Moffat, Lisa Prentice, Michelle and Kevin, Amanda M, Rebecca Morris, Yennefer, Jessica Lasley, Brock Bollard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scoutmonk405, Z Harris, Unladylike13, Ventura CA, Elizabeth Mayers, Alexia Tuttle, Marshana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D, Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Madis Afelter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Coro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, 
Monica Levelace and Alex. I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.